History tends to repeat itself, and the 17-time NBA championship winning Boston Celtics have a great chance to add ring number 18 in 2023. Even with 2021's champions in the Bucks right on this team's heels having won 10 straight, I think Chris Middleton's long-term ability to stay healthy is a real concern for Milwaukee. Chris was out all playoffs last year and has been limited to just 16 games total this season. While for Boston, Jalen Brown is out with a facial fracture after taking an elbow to the grill from Jason Tatum, which we'll get to. Historically, and for the last few years, JB's been very durable. So it's not like we're concerned long term about the hybrid of Kawhi and LeBron's injury status. Meanwhile, for Jason Tatum, despite inadvertently elbowing JB, he promised to buy Jalen a car afterwards, to which Jalen only heard about a few days later. I'll just leave this clip right here. It's been tough the last couple of days, but yeah, I'm about to get a car. He's right here. He said, I'm getting a car, bro. He said, Jason, Jason Tatum, I'm getting a car. Then Brown would also say, quote, it's going to take more than a Jason Tatum elbow to take me out. If you didn't see the play, it's a 50-50 ball that you could argue either Tatum or Brown could have gotten to. Just bad luck, nothing more to it. And with the interaction I just showed, it's not like this is anything at all like a Draymond Jordan Poole type beef in any sense. Thing is with Brown and Tatum, they both rightfully feel they're the number one guy which can lead to the occasional and non-figurative clashing of heads. It's worth noting, this is coincidentally the second time that Tatum's elbowed Brown in the grill inadvertently, as he chipped Brown's tooth on Christmas Day in 2020. Mentality-wise, the Jays are like having the combo forward version of Prime Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant, purely in terms of their ego. In terms of how they get along, that's completely different. There is no spare change left behind in the interactions between Jason and Jalen. They're straight up with one another and take out any potential underlying frustration on the court. They do that by trying to one-up each other's production in the best way that helps the team win on any given night. Jason Tatum did just have a brutal shooting night, albeit in a win, and his MVP case may be slipping behind Jokic and Giannis's, but can we please not start sleeping on how, for the most part this season, Tatum's resembled the combo forward version of Stephen Curry with some of the moves he's pulling off. Ranging from Smitty moves leading to three-pointers to moving jab steps leading to distance bombs, JT has used his advanced bag on the perimeter to become the youngest player since the three-point line was introduced 43 years ago to make 1,000 three-pointers. Going back to Jalen Brown, who was getting reps up before their last game, and it's become maybe not concerning given he and Jason know how to vibe off each other's play styles and mentalities on and off the court, but it's become confusing between he and Tatum from a media and fan perspective to properly label who's going to be relied upon as the main alpha when it's winning time in the playoffs. Nevertheless, the currently 25 game over 500 Boston Celtics are still a game and a half above Milwaukee despite the raging hot streak from the Bucks. At times, this Boston team can resemble a deer in the headlights with their approach to the game in terms of confidence, execution, and knowing their roles. We saw that on full display when the 2022 NBA Finals was right there for them to win, but they failed to both consistently take care of possession, leading to sloppy turnovers, and to put out the correct game plan on Stephen Curry. If it was me, I would have been trapping him all day, but they played straight up defense on Steph for the most part. Potential sixth man of the year who wasn't here in that series though in Malcolm Brogdon, as well as the improved defense of an underrated offensive player who's fitting in better during his second year in Beantown in Derek White. In addition to the disrespected bulldog archetype out of Oregon in Peyton Pritchard, may give Boston the point guard depth to finally take care of the rock like they're supposed to. More details on all of what I just mentioned and more are coming up. And if you want more takes just like you're about to hear and have been hearing, make sure you're subscribed and have notifications on if you don't, and leave a thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm. Anytime you beat a team with this pregame warm-up, everyone wins, not just Celtic fans. But against the expected contending caliber villain of the NBA, the fully healthy Memphis Grizzlies, despite Jason Tatum shooting 3 for 16 from the field, Boston dropped 119 points against the number 3 ranked NBA defense and won by double digits.
Tatum remains undefeated against Memphis in his career, but story of the night was the front court of Time Lord and Big Al, who give this Boston team a 1980s type feel to it. Williams and Horford combined for 26 points and 24 rebounds. Luke Cornett was a game high plus 10, all displaying Boston's under talked about depth at the center position. An outing earlier, the Celtics set their franchise record for threes in a first half, with 16 of them against Charlotte. That was also without Brown and Smart like they played their last game without, along with, in that Charlotte game, Al Horford. Kudos to Jason Tatum, who could have kept forcing it on a rare off night in the team's last game. He could have hauled up like 25 attempts to stat pad for the trash-talking Twitter demons. Tatum would instead stay engaged defensively by racking up two blocks and two steals, and he was also the team's third leading rebounder on the night. That kind of performance from Jason isn't the worst thing, especially when Jalen Brown gets back and when you consider all the firepower Boston provably has around their NBA best duo. Sometimes it works to be the Curry to Jalen Brown's Durant or the LeBron to Jalen Brown's Anthony Davis. Being that 1B scoring option, just drawing gravity off the dribble, collapsing the defense, initiating swing-swing action, whether in half-court sets, early offense, or in transition, is all Tatum needs to do. Even if that results in a hockey assist, at least he created a basket. That said, Jason does have a tendency to settle for threes too often when he could simply use his view over the top of most defenders he faces and his strength to get a better look down low. More often than settling for threes, I suggest Tatum too, at a higher volume, be finding the right lanes and body angles to attack downhill. However, with his current left wrist injury that needs to, but isn't getting surgery on, the finishing at the cup, finesse-wise, is a tad concerning. But JT's an Iron Man, he's not gonna sit out. Tatum's wrist injury paired with JB having lost his rhythm recently, given he's been out for the last little while and is going to be up for a little while, could make you even more concerned. The biggest concern, in my opinion, is the dynamic between Tatum and Brown, which will have to wait until Jalen's injury return to be sorted out in a limited amount of games. All that said, the improved depth for the Celtics in 2023 can bail them out. We'll get to more players that don't get enough respect for their contributions to the number one seed out East in Al Horford and Time Lord Rob Will, among others. You can't forget about floor spacing product of Marquette and Virginia in Sam Hauser. Hauser just made six of his 11 triples against Memphis, cultivating in his second 20-point game of the season. He's been outstanding over the past four games. Just check out these numbers. But overall on the season, his 41% three-point stroke is 20th in the NBA. What Hauser's doing for the team with the best record in the NBA is pretty insane, given he was undrafted. Meanwhile, second and 16th league-wide and first and second on Boston in three-point percentage are Batman Grant Williams and Derek White. Derek's aptitude defensively, being one of the best guard shot blockers on the planet, as well as his extra shot creation offensively, have been criminally under-talked about assets to Boston's success. In retrospect, it's insane that it only took giving up Josh Richardson to San Antonio to receive this man at last year's deadline, as Derek scored 21 points in Golden State to help Boston seal home court advantage in Game 1 of the NBA Finals. Shockingly, so far in February, White's averaging 22 points, 6 boards, and 5 dimes per game. His efficiency is even more shocking, as 22 points every night is being provided on the same true shooting percentage as Stephen Curry on the year as a whole, 66%. Bottom line is, players I haven't or barely even mentioned today would be massive contributors elsewhere. One of those players who have a bigger role somewhere else, as I've actually mentioned in the past, is the legend from Oregon, Peyton Pritchard. After the deadline passed, Pritchard told the media, quote, I definitely was expecting and hoping for a trade. But you know, I have to look at the good things, we're the best team in the NBA right now, end quote. Peyton, however, would quickly clear up any confusion that he wanted out, saying, quote, I love this city, I love this organization, I love my teammates, I want to help this team in any way I can to win a championship. This whole thing is about me wanting to play, because that's what I love to do, end quote. That story from Pritchard proves to you right there how much depth Boston really has, specifically at point guard with Derek White, Marcus Smart, and Malcolm Brogdon. The weapons are stacked up at Missoula's disposal, 
While you could argue Pritchard deserves more time, as I mentioned before, White and Brogdon have been consistent all year, so there's no reason to play those two at Pritchard's position less than Pritchard himself. But fact of the matter is, you can't hate on a player for wanting to do his job, especially after what he said to the organization after that. Look for Pritchard to stay ready in practice and win Boston a game or two in 2023's playoffs when his number does get finally called. What's your main concern for the 2023 Celtics? Best answer down below in the comments gets next video shout out. Community Speaks winner for today is FYI Sin, who says the most exciting part about the Suns is Chris Paul. He's got two really great options next to him in KD and Book, plus still has Aiton as a third option. It'll be exciting to see Paul set up Aiton, Booker, or Durant, end quote. Thanks for watching, have a good one.